Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 152 of The Criminologist Podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. This week, we are bringing you part one of my interview with Martin Bean. Martin is currently the executive director of anti-recidivism.com. As you are all about to discover, Martin is passionate about second chances built on higher education, which he feels is the foundation of second chances. We often talk on this podcast about the trajectories that our clients may be on and how practitioners need to better consider those trajectories in their interactions with their clientele. Well, Martin does this in his work examining both pre- and post-incarceration stages and considers each of those experiences in his work. Martin feels that incarcerated men and women require a prison coach, just as anyone enrolled in a 12-step recovery program finds a way out by engaging with a sponsor or coach to return to a responsible community lifestyle. Now, Martin believes that incarceration is about empathy with compliance and educational supportive changes, not just pivoting human warehousing time. Now, in part one of Martin's story, you are all about to hear his backstory, if you will, which, trust me, is like no other backstory you've ever heard on this podcast. Please. Enjoy my interview with Martin Bean, joining us all the way today from beautiful San Diego, California. And I will see you all on the other side. Hello, Martin. Welcome to the show. This week, I am interviewing Martin Bean of anti-recidivism.com. Hello, Marty, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Joe. It's great to be with you today. So before we get into the fantastic work that you're doing around anti-recidivism efforts and specifically education, introduce yourself uh, to the audience a little bit. I am the executive director of anti-recidivism.com, and our focus is to provide higher education support and peer support to individuals who have found themselves arrested, incarcerated, or on serving time now on probation and parole here in the United States. And again, a worthwhile effort to give context to this journey that you've been on leading up to this. Tell our audience a little bit about your your backstory, as it were, or again, those, those steps along the way in your journey that led up to where we are today. In 2002, I had a partner by the name of Linda Allen from Winnipeg, Canada. And at that time, seniors were going in mass numbers to Canada to save money on their prescription drugs. And so my background uh, with marketing and advertising and running a business uh, really lent itself to this new world and new platform. And Linda and I became uh, very good friends. And so I went up to Winnipeg, Manitoba uh, and began a business by the name of CanadiansDrugstore.com. And it was an internet pharmacy based uh, with a brick and mortar licensed pharmacy in Winnipeg. And we began doing the uh, mail order uh, pharmaceutical business to seniors here in America. And in Canada, even with uh, Winnipeg being the hub of that this new industry, which was actually started by two kids out of college, it wasn't legal 
throughout the entire country of Canada. The federal uh, legislation in Canada didn't really want to take a look at it, so they had it drop down to each province, whether or not each province would make it legal or illegal. And the process is only legal in three provinces throughout the entire country of Canada. And so we began that uh, business and it started to do very well until uh, about 2003, uh, Medicare Plan D passed in the middle of the night uh, and is still uh, currently on the books as far as prescription drugs and uh, costs uh, for seniors here in the United States. So with the traffic stopping, you know, Linda and I looked at each other and said, well, what are we going to do? We were hearing about oncologists in the United States who were dispensing the chemo drugs, oncology uh, chemo drugs, to their patients at their office. And this practice became legal during the Reagan administration. It was set up to really take the pressure off of the hospital systems. And so they were receiving dispensing fees uh, for the service. And for some reason, every year or so, the fee began to diminish. And uh, so we said, well, maybe there's something that we can we can do there and, and, and help help out, if you will. And so I was the original architect uh, of creating a Global RX Store. And what that meant was a global licensed wholesale pharmaceutical network to collect the best price from the same manufacturers, the same FDA requirements and patents, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we began that practice. And we did that for about five years, uh, day in, day out. And I mean, it was the same drug, same prescription. I mean, the same, everything was the same. Now the difference was price. And that scope would be anywhere from 100 to 300% difference in price. And so we accumulated in a, about a about 12 month period, about 40, 42 doctors on our client list. And we were doing just fine with the business and receiving a lot of compliments and, and thank you for the savings, uh, those types of uh, replies. And then uh, in June 2011, uh, I had uh, relocated back into the United States uh, in Florida, in Boca Raton. Sunrise. There is about a 20 to 25 man SWAT team on my front lawn. Sprinklers were still working. They didn't care. The pounding on the walls, the language, the screaming, the automatic weapons, the red dots flying all over the living room had quite a dramatic awakening for me that morning. And in they came. Uh, guns uh, pointed at me, and, and, and you know, I, you know, I didn't move once the door was open. And then chaos. And all I can remember, like it was yesterday, I hear the words "clear, clear, clear." Mr. Bean, are there any guns in the house? Anybody else in the house? You know, we'll find the money. We'll find the money. We'll find the drugs. We're here now. Where are they? There were no guns. There were no drugs. There was nothing in floorboards or, or behind the wall. So let me, can I jump in here real quick, Martin, for our listeners who may be outside of the United States or Canada, um, in, in Europe, for example, maybe give some context to what the feds were alleging at this point or what, if they connect the dots for them on, on what, on, give some context. So there were no drugs. There were no uh, drugs or money in the wall, nothing hidden. Uh, I, I never dispensed one single drug because I wasn't licensed. That's the reason why we had the global network, including our network in the United States. And that firm was based in San Diego, California. So based on that SWAT team exercise and the, and the neighbors, of course, had a field day, 
I closed the business. So the business closed. Now, there was no notification in Canada with Health Canada uh, to Linda where the business was actually corporate based in Winnipeg. There was no feedback or any problems uh, throughout Europe to the network. Uh, it was only in America. And as you know, America pays more for their prescription drugs than any country on in the planet. And so, but the business did close that day. And uh, I granted an interview at that time with the FDA representative, um, along with customs uh, official. And um, I was not arrested that day. So as things calmed down, all the chaos and the running around and the guns and so forth uh, seemed to calm everyone. Everybody calmed down and they realized that there were no guns. There were no there was no money. OK. And are they at the right house? And who put this investigation together? OK. So everybody's, you know, they started in their rolling out the door and, and leaving and the trucks started leaving and eyes were rolling and, and everybody was disappointed except me. And I was still in a bit of a shock. All right. So now we have the business closed. There's no more income. There's no more being operative. And now what? Well, Linda and I would talk several times a day, and actually it was quite a disruption uh, in our lives because we were planning to marry the first quarter of 2012, and it was going to be a Valentine's Day type wedding, time-wise. That's not going to happen. Uh, so what do we do? Okay. Well, November, a couple of months go by, and now it's late November. And Linda, it's the Saturday night, and Linda's going to a dinner party with her best friends, and, and I had known the, them as well, and they were good friends to me also. Uh, and I get a call from Linda prior to the dinner, and uh, you know, I said, you know, tell everybody I said hello, and 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 you know, and sure, I'd be happy to, honey, and I'll call you when I get back. Okay, fine. Well, a few hours later, around midnight, the phone did ring. It wasn't Linda. It was Linda's daughter-in-law, Pam, uh, who was very upset and, and nervous. And I said, hi, Pam, how are you? And she's, Marty, I, don't, I do not know how to tell you this, so I'm just going to tell you. Linda had a massive stroke at dinner. She is in the ambulance as we speak to Grace Hospital. Brian is in the car, warming the car up, and I'm on my way to get into the car, and we're going off to the hospital. Call Roy for the, you know, any other details. Well, that's a shock. I mean, wait a minute. This is, you know, how did this happen? I called Roy. Roy filled me in on, on what happened and, and the passing out at the table and so forth. And they tried CPR, and the ambulance people. And EMTs uh, arrive very quickly. Uh, the hospital is only about a 10 minute drive uh, without the sirens in the middle of the night and the lights. And so, you know, there wasn't any any issue there as far as getting Linda's uh, medical attention. Uh, Linda uh, did not uh, come out of the coma and left us much too soon. It's now the Christmas holidays in December, which was you know, obviously very bleak. And now you have the first quarter of 2012. And when you think things just can't get any worse, the months roll around to September, September 12th, 2012. And there's another knock on the door, sunrise. It's the same FDA gentleman, only this time with one accomplice. And he's a U.S. Marshal. And he said, Marty, I'm sorry to tell you, but we're here to arrest you. I'm cuffed politely and I get dressed and I we get into the waiting car and we go off to the West Palm Beach judicial courts. And I, I'm ushered into the court. Everybody was waiting for me. Mr. Bean, good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. 
We have here 35 federal counts with a maximum penalty of 131 years. It's difficult to ascertain. And the magistrate was kind enough to stop three times during the reading of each count. Because let's say my knees were getting a little weak and that podium was now my best friend that I'm standing behind. I was held over uh, in West Palm Beach at the, at the jail. No bail. And a few days later, I was uh, moved to the MCC federal facility in Miami. From there, I was uh, transported to California, where the case was to be held and heard. Uh, I was uh, shackled, cuffed, and standing on the tarmac with a number of other uh, incarcerated adults waiting to board the federal airline, which has its nickname from the movie Con Air. I was on Con Air. And if you saw the movie, you know about Con Air. Uh, That's the real deal. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, Marty, but I've got to be thinking, I was putting myself in your shoes, the counts being read off, and I said to myself, your knees must have buckled. Is this just surreal to you? This is like something out of a Kaf- like a Kafka novel. Like, this is not happening to me. This is a uh, combination of all of what you just, all the above, okay? And, I mean, I you would think there'd be a scriptwriter for this. Absolutely. You know? Um and so, uh, yeah, it, it was surreal. Uh, I had never been arrested. Uh, my upbringing was completely the opposite side of the aisle. I mean, it was. I mean, we, we you know, it's, it's a middle class Americana upbringing and story. Uh, and no, this is this is this is absolutely. Surreal. I've seen them. I've seen the movie Con Air and I'm wondering, you mentioned I've never been arrested. I'm. Pretty certain the feds don't have a section on that plane, you know, a la first class or business class versus coach. They don't have the, <laughs> oh, we want the never been arrested people up here. That, that, that you, you weren't surrounded by other first timers, were you? Yeah. What, what they do have is they have caged and non caged, <laughs> okay. you know. At, no, they do, seriously. And, and so, uh, you know, and a number of the, uh, the, the individuals that were on the plane are masked with the leather mask because of biting or spitting. Okay. Then there's also the individuals, a real high level individual that are, have a special handcuff, which comes with a box and it was supposedly designed by an inmate. And, uh, that's what they wear. Okay. And of course you're shackled. Now try and have a sandwich or drink a can of soda with that. You know, you know, in front of you, and and that's 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 how you're treated. I'm a I'm a per, I'm a pretty tall drink of water, uh, Marty, and my wife's heard me complain about having to fly long flights and be uncomfortable. And I'm never going to complain again about where my seat is after hearing this story. Hey, you tell her the Marty Bean story, you know, and and actually, uh, Con Air, for, to use that term, was the only airline. Or multiple airline uh, planes still flying during 9/11 were the only ones that were permitted airspace. Okay, so I arrive in uh, Victorville, California. Eventually, uh, there was a brief stop, uh, just a few hours, uh, in Oklahoma City, which is the hub of that uh, airline. And uh, you never know where you're going. They, you're not told a thing, but you have an idea that you're going to San Diego. You're going to get there sooner or later. And so we are, uh, I arrive in Victorville and I'm placed in a step fan, okay, which is also has its cages, okay, for the interior, part of the interior. And then driven down to San Diego and uh, even further to right to the border. You're, you're in Otay Mesa, which borders the Tijuana crossing into Mexico. And I'm placed in a medium to high secure prison in lieu of bail. Okay. Now, I've been up for the most part three or four days. 
And the, the one correction officer said to me, hey, Bean, get ready. You have to go in front of the magistrate in a few hours. And I, I remember looking at him and I'm saying, can we do this on Monday? He, said, he laughed. He says, no. We, and it's Friday. We have to do it today. You know, I said, OK, all right. And so off I go to the magistrate. And once again, good morning, Mr. Bean. Bail is set at two million dollars. Now, that opens up all of the money bail issues and so forth and so on. So we're not going to go into that today. But obviously, there's no two million dollars. And a federal uh, two million dollar bail is different than there's no bail. Okay. So, all right. So Bean is still shackled. He's put back on the bus and Bean goes to prison in lieu of bail for six months. And that's the amount of time that's allotted to sign what they term a plea agreement. So you will sign a plea agreement or you will go to trial under the, how the federal judicial system works. And the success rate or failure rate on a, fail, on a federal a case like that is about 99.9%. Prosecutor's going to win. So they made an arrangement that all of the charges, uh, the 35 counts, and the, with the maximum 131 years, goes away. This happened with my first meeting with my my attorney, who is what they call a panel attorney member within the federal system. And I said to him, how did that happen? He said, oh, I took care of it. Did you know? Well, that's power. OK. My upbringing tells me that's not going to that's not true. Okay. So but anyway, uh, they, they changed the, the procedure to one count of conspiracy to commit mail fraud. So, you know, looking at him with tears in my eyes, I said, well, what happened to the international money laundering? How's this, you know, now, now what happened? I tried to go to the post office without a stamp. I mean, what are we, you know, and, and I, I thought about it for a week. I mean, what? He said, don't worry about it. That, that's the that's deal. And he said, you know, we just need to sign the plea agreement and we're good to go. Now, keep in mind, there might be a certain corporate, maybe big pharma <laughs> organization watching all the procedures because my case is, and I hope it still is, unprecedented in case law. And it turns out that there is a statute of law, of law, that very few people realize. It's in the Drug Cosmetic Act, Food, Food Drug Cosmetic Act section, that prohibits importation of any drugs, FDA, not, and we're talking about commercial drugs, without the express written consent of the FDA. Now, the FDA, people say, well, Marty, come on, you're smart, you did, you're this, you're that. How come you, how is it you couldn't possibly have contacted the FDA? Come on, Marty, you know better than that. The FDA, during the early 2000s, during the George Bush administration, only had a chairperson for about one third of Mr. Bush's administration. The one individual who was who, who did chair the FDA, you know, he resigned. He had an opportunity and resigned. And the very next day was on the board of Pfizer. It's the old Washington shuffle. Yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't contact the FDA. So and you think you're a drop in the bucket, so to speak, you know, on on everything, because our business was doing well. But comparatively speaking. No, I mean, it was just a drop in the bucket. And so uh, I went and spent six months at the prison in uh, San Ysidro. It was uh, privatized by uh, at that time they were known as CCA uh, and now uh, Core Civic. 
and they were very fair to me. Very fair. I have, I have nothing negative about the prison itself, the staff. Uh, they were all very, very good to me. And the inmates uh, showed me a tremendous level of respect, which was needed because I must confess to you, Joe, I was terrified. And it was, you know, we mentioned earlier about being surreal. It was like going down the rabbit's hole in Alice in Wonderland. Which yeah. I allude to in my book. I did. I have a memoir coming out uh, where prison is a part of it. Uh, it's entitled "All My Tomorrows," and it begins its first chapter with "What's Yesterday," and the fourteenth chapter, "All My," is turned "All My Tomorrows." It, the book is dedicated to Linda Allen, Linda M. Allen, and who was the love of my life, and we were the soulmates for each other, and. That stopped way too soon, and and so uh, time rolls away, goes along, and I decide, okay, we are, we'll do the plea agreement. We'll just sign the plea agreement because I at that point, here's the deal, Bean. We either go, you either sign this plea agreement, or we go to court and with a jury, and the jury just might have a, a number of doctors, pharmacists. It may be even big pharma members. I don't know. Who could tell? So what do you want to do? So we thought the, 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 the premise was that I would receive probation and time served for the six months, and that would be the end of it. I mean, because obviously Bean's not going to go back into the pharmaceutical business, and Linda had passed away. And so all the, all the destruction, I'm down to ashes. I mean, I don't know how much more an individual can take. Then, you know, the cycle beginning with a SWAT team on the lawn at sunrise, then the death of his you know, soulmate a few months later, and then being arrested. Marty Bean is in prison. It's, that's a lot to, to deal with. That's a lot to deal with. And so uh, I signed a plea agreement. Uh, all of a sudden, a $2 million bail was lifted, and it was a signature bond from my sister. And so... I leave the prison and I go to a halfway house here in San Diego. And from there, I meet the uh, head counselor, the number two person that, that was uh, overseeing the, the, it's a very large halfway house here in San Diego. There's two, both operated by uh, now Core Civic, which at that time was CCA. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to gain a, a great deal of respect with the, uh, the inmates, if you will, the, the adults uh, there. And also the staff. So my first meeting with the, with the counselor, she said to me, okay, Bean, what do you want to do with your life? You know, a standard question. And I told her about anti-recidivism.com. And you could just see her eyes roll and they say, how did, I, how did this happen? You know, I mean, okay, well, we're not going to discourage you, Mr. Bean. But here's the deal. For it to go any further, okay, uh, I need to have permission from your prosecutor, your pretrial person, and my senior advisor here at the halfway house. And I said, okay. I said, may I write a business plan for you rather than it just be word of mouth? And she said, absolutely. I said, how much time do you need? I told her about four weeks. And I did the business plan. And Joe, what do you think the odds are of something like that passing? Do tell, Martin. Odds makers won't even put it up on the board, for, you know. And but for some reason, it passed, and I was given permission. And so everybody was, you know, quietly very excited about this because nobody's nobody's ever done this. No one's been going through the DOJ swamp, if you will, as I have, and then turned around and you want to do what? Really? And there's a reason for that. Uh, okay, so uh, I go ahead and I start, and about nine months later, it's uh, September again, only the 2013, and it's sentencing day for Mr. Bean. Now, Mr. Bean is feeling pretty good. Uh, he thinks that it's going to be uh, probation sir, and time served. And there is a jail system that's highly, highly interested in Mr. Bean and his program. Okay. 
And so everybody's feeling pretty good except the attorney. And we went into the courtroom and uh, 10 a.m. sharp, uh, Judge Hayes, who was brilliant. But at the time, it took me a little bit of time to process that, to get to that definition. Um, because of the shock uh, of what happened. And it turned out that, Mr. Bean, you're going to prison. That was a really difficult day. Uh, and there's steps that you follow through. You, you immediately leave the courtroom. You go to the marshal's office. You report in because they gave me about six weeks uh, lead time. And then you, from there, you go up to uh, the same building. You're in the same building. You go up to pretrial and you report in. And there was a little bit of a surprise uh, on that floor as well when I told him the news. And so you leave, you go back to the halfway house and everybody's waiting to hear what happened. And you say, yes, I'm leaving. I, I, Bean, I told you not to worry. You know, everything's, I said, no, no, no. I'm going to prison. Bean, stop fooling around. You know, stop, uh, I said, no, I'm going to prison. And Mr. Bean went to prison. And he was fortunately sentenced to the level of a camp, which I, you know, I had heard all along my journey, starting originally in Florida, about being, you're going to go to a camp, not to worry. You're not even with us guys, you know. And I say, come on, guys, let me in. I could be, <laughs> no, no, being, <laughs> no, 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 you're going to a camp. OK. And what what began this this anti recidivism to really put it in earnest uh, was one morning I, I walk out of my cell and there is an individual uh, who holds the title of shot caller. And the shot caller in a prison setting a culture is the individual who keeps uh, law and order uh, amongst the inmates so that the administrative staff doesn't get overburdened. And when the shot caller speaks to you, you listen, you listen. So we're there in the morning and he says, I said, hello, I'm Marty Bean. He says, Bean, I know who you are. I hear really good things. He said, and he, he said, can you help me out? Well, he said, sure, I'll try. Now the shot caller was brilliant. He would do a crossword puzzle every day. And he says, Bean, I say, he said, I'm having problems with my crossword puzzle. He said, would you know a city in Switzerland, four letters, uh, because that's what's missing in my crossword puzzle. And Joe, I have to tell you something. Big, Big Pharma's global headquarters is in Switzerland, in the very city. And so even though Linda and I had traveled all throughout Europe and so forth and so on, I knew that city, and I said, "Well, how does this city does does it work for you?" He puts he puts he goes, "Bean," he said, "This is it. This is it. You're the man." And I, I thought, "Oh, thank God." <laughs> and, so, and, and, and so we said, "Okay." Now he said, "I'm going to talk to you." He said, "We have we have another problem." I said, "Oh, all right. What's that?" He said, "Bean, individuals come in uh, a lot of personal problems, uh, family problems, depression." He said, "I can't handle that." He said, would you mind if I sent the individuals to you and would you talk to them? And I was, you know, flattered. And I, I said, yeah, sure. No problem. And I have to tell you, Joe, there's nothing like having a six foot six shaved head, tattooed head to toe. I'm sure individual knock on your cell door and say, shakingly, Mr. Bean, can, can I talk to you for a minute? Would it be okay? And that's what happened. And I said, sure, come on in. And I introduced myself. And within five minutes, Joe, that individual has water in his eyes. And he's finally found a trusted soul that he can talk to and who understands his dilemma and maybe have it a little direction for him. And that's what happened. That, and, and so word like that gets through a prison culture or jail culture very, very quickly. 
Okay. So I became that type of role model and respect and protected it, even though it, that never really had to be an issue, um, uh, serving my time uh, in San Diego. So when I was sentenced, I didn't know the camp. Then they don't tell you about a camp or if they did, it didn't, doesn't register because you're, you, you're numb. You just turn numb. And I've been numb since I was arrested. I mean, wearing handcuffs and so, and trying to survive. And so, uh, I, I, I arrive at the camp and it is a camp. I mean, all of the, the definition of a camp, and uh, Camp Snoopy, Camp Marriott, uh, applied to this facility in, in Taft, California. But I was there, I was sentenced to two years, and I was given the six months credit for being in the uh, prison uh, in lieu of bail. And so now I'm down to a year and a half. All right. So I meet the staff once again, fortunately. Uh, the same same issue, the respect, and uh, the same issue with the inmates. Although it's a different type of inmate at a camp. At a camp, you have more of your political individuals, your lawyers, your accountants, your doctors, uh, and other factions. But it's really a white collar uh, colony, if you will, culture. And so that's where I that's where I was. And Joe, uh, it really resonated up to the last day uh a year goes by and now i'm sent, i'm going to be released for good behavior etc and if you have respect uh, your friends or the people that know you will have a dinner for you the night before you leave and so there was a dinner and it's amazing how creative people can be with a microwave i must tell you even though we had a dining room not a chow hall okay but someone all this was a private dinner. I mean, they didn't they didn't rent out the dining room for Marty Bean, <laughs> which was fine. But uh, it's amazing how creative people can be with a microwave. So we have the dinner and the dinner's winding down. And this one individual stands up and he says, Bean, I have an announcement. So all right, all right, what, what would you like to say? He said, Bean, I'm going to tell you right now. We think the world of you, what you want to do. And Bean, we're, I'm telling you. Right, directly right now, you have no right to fail. Don't let us down. And don't forget about us. And Joe, it's been a number of years to this day, and I tell you, I've never forgotten about them. So I assured them that I would not, and that it was in earnest. Uh, not some lip service uh, comments that I were making while incarcerated. And then when I walk out the door, I forget everybody that was that I met behind the door. And they got that. They understood that. So I'm now uh, transferred down to San Diego, San Diego to the other halfway house. And a number of the staff who were in the other halfway house, the first halfway house, the pretrial halfway house, are now in the post uh, care. Uh, halfway house. And so it was like old home week. Now that sounds kind of weird. I know. But let me tell you something. When your whole life is in a cardboard box and you just got off a Greyhound bus from Bakersfield and you get on the trolley in San Diego and you're two stops down toward the going toward the border. Any any inkling of support just magnifies itself. And so to see these a, a few individuals who were really happy to see me, I mean, it was it it, it was really needed and it, it was really, really special. And uh, actually, there were even two people there from Taft that would kind of opened up or introduced the fact that Marty Bean was coming down to back down to San Diego. And so that all began. Now, we're in the pre-COVID era. Uh, which means uh, if you speak to anyone in a DOC or BOP about higher education, uh, computers, uh, we won't even use the word cell phones. No, we're not, we're not going to mention those. Or tablets, it's like speaking Greek. And I, I ran into nothing but uh, encouragement, 
But you talk about having to really have an extra set of patience. Uh, that's where I was at. COVID uh, came into be a play and, and changed the landscape, not just, you know, around the world, but really changed the landscape as far as the DOC was concerned. And now laptops, e-learning, and tablets are part of the landscape. And now we're starting to get traction that's needed for inmates and reach their higher level of education, which is the key. To me, it doesn't matter whether you live outside the wall, inside the wall. Without education, your life is going to take a certain chartered trip. It doesn't matter whether you're inside or outside. But education is the key. And then you need that support going through the education process in order to gain the diploma or the the vocational certification. A great place to insert a cliffhanger, if you will. Martin, of course, will be back to pick up on this conversation, highlighting his journey into and out of the criminal justice system. Martin left some clues along the way as to what we will pick up on next time. Hopefully, you have picked up on these themes around the importance not only of education, but of having a strong support system in place to augment that key variable in the change process. And I promise Martin will expand on his themes when he rejoins us. Until then, we should all go out and watch or rewatch the movie Con Air, which we will now have a bit more context with thanks to Martin. He also referenced the Linda M. Allen College Prep Academy for incarcerated adults. We are going to do a deep dive on that next time as well. And of course, I have left the web link for anti-recidivism.com in the episode description of this program. Please check that out. We will be back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, theparagongroupllc.com, for training or presentations as to core correctional skills, implementation, or, of course, the topic of desistance from crime. If you have questions or comments as to this podcast, feel free to contact the show via our email of thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. That's the criminologist podcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook and Instagram pages at the criminologist podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. The criminologist media group is also on Twitter. Give us a follow at Crim Media Group. That's C R I M Media Group. You may also connect with me or Martin Bean on LinkedIn and follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Hey, lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this podcast. And if you believe in what we're doing on the show, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word. Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the podcast and of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them, there's only us. Yeah, what, what they do have is they have caged and non-caged, you know. No, they do, seriously. And and so, uh, you know, and a number of the, uh, the, the individuals that were on the plane are masked with the leather mask because of biting or spitting. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist Podcast and The Criminologist Channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening.